So now as we continue our look at blood, we've gone over the non-cellular component of blood, which was plasma. We're now going to be shifting and focusing on the cellular components of blood by entitling this next flowchart, Cellular Components 1. And here, as we're going through this flowchart, I think a really nice summative figure to represent all of these cells that we'll be going over is figure 42.17. So be sure to look at that as we go through this. So let's begin by understanding where blood cells come from, the cells that make up blood. Those are going to be exclusively, exclusively and only produced in a very specific part of the body known as the bone marrow. So they are specifically produced in the bone marrow and even more specifically of only very specific and certain bones. Not all bones will be producing blood cells. So bone marrow is this interior portion of bones that's constantly differentiating and dividing and producing lots and lots of cells. Um, the specific bones at which we will be producing cellular components of blood would be specifically like the ribs, the different vertebrae that we have within our spine, the sternum will be another bone, and the pelvis. So all of these will have lots of division, lots of differentiation going on. So speaking of, how do we get from a very simple cell into a very complex blood cell? There's a specific process of differentiation, of specialization that has to undergo or be done by these cells within the bone marrow. And that's specifically going to be utilizing the idea of a multipotent stem cell. So multipotent stem cells are going to be found within the bone marrow. These are what's going to, uh, these are what are going to develop and differentiate and specialize into blood cells. But now it's not just going to happen by itself. There's actually going to be very specific cues and different uh, developmental mechanisms to allow for this to happen. But in order to understand that, we need to really break down this word. What does it mean to mul be multipotent and what does it mean to be a stem cell? If we look at these two words, first of all, let's understand what stem cells are. Stem cells are things we've heard of many, many times over, but what we want to just state is that stem cells are very much undifferentiated cells. These are cells that have not chosen their fate or have not become the cells that they will become. They can literally become anything. But when we use this term multipotent, we are actually a sort of allowing these stem cells to not become anything but become specifically a certain type of cell. Multipotency, specifically in this situation of the bone marrow stem cells, would mean that these cells can differentiate into not any old type of cell, but they can differentiate into any blood cell, specifically. That's what we mean by multipotent. Another term some people use is or get confused with is totipotent. Totipotent means it can become anything, but multipotent means it, become, it can become multiple things, okay? Just a couple of different things, and that's specifically in regards to blood cells. So we have undifferentiated possible blood cells within the bone marrow. So what happens, and how do they become the bone cells eventually? Well, what has to happen is that the multipotent M C, uh, M S C, multipotent stem cell, um, divides. That's the first step, and this is happening within the bone marrow. And what's going to happen is eventually one of the daughter cells, there will be two, one of these divided daughter cells becomes a blood cell. One daughter cell differentiates, in other words. It specializes. It becomes the blood cell that it is supposed to become, whatever that may be. And the other one, the other blood cell, the other multipotent stem cell, I should say, other remains a stem cell. It does not differentiate. It remains a stem cell. Now, why is that? Why does the other one, the other daughter cell, remain a stem cell? Well, that's because you want to make sure that you never run out of stem cells. You always want a lot of stem cells because, remember, we have five liters of blood that constantly is being used over and over and over again. The cells are dying. They need to be regenerated. So we need to constantly be making blood cells. That's a big theme of, cell, of, of the cellular components is that they're constantly being made. And therefore, because we always have one stem cell, even after the division of the multipotent stem cells, we basically can state the following. We don't run out of stem cells. And that's very important because we never want to run out of blood. It's a, a super important uh, component of our lives, our livelihood. And therefore, it makes sense to make sure that the cells that become blood cells do not ever run out. And that's why we have this sort of 
partition of resources where one becomes and differentiates itself into a blood cell, the other does not. It stays a stem cell so that we have a nice supply of stem cells that can further differentiate it when and if it need be. So that's our story of where they come from. Let's first now begin looking at the actual cellular components now. What is the possible differentiation? What can you possibly become if you are a multipotent stem cell within the bone marrow? The most important thing I think for the ter in terms of blood is to understand the erythrocytes. This is the first type of cell that we're going to be going over. And let me make sure I spell this correctly. Erythrocytes. So these are specifically all going to be red blood cells, RBCs. So this is something that can differentiate from originally as a multipotent stem cell into a red blood cell otherwise known as an erythrocyte. These are going to be the most numerous blood cells within our body. There are a lot of these, the most numerous of all blood cells of all blood cells. So there's many erythrocytes all throughout us, um, and they have about a 120-day lifespan. That's it. They don't live as long as we do. So what does that mean? That means that every 120 days that the erythrocytes are dying out, you need new ones. And it makes sense that this is constantly happening successfully because of the multipotent stem cell divisions that allow stem cells to stay and become uh, more and more red blood cells as needed. So we have a 100-day lifespan here. It's important to recognize that we're constantly turning over our supply of red blood cells. So there's a lot of them. It's about 25 trillion within us. In one milliliter of blood, there may be anywhere from five to six million red blood cells. So it's a big, big amount. Now, that means that they have, must have a very important function. In order to understand their function, we need to first understand a little bit about their structure. And their structure is the following. Erythrocytes have a flexible biconcave disc structure. Okay, if you look at the figure, it'll give you a good representation of what a blood cell looks like, a red blood cell specifically. The flexibility is very important, and the biconcave shape is both very important. The reason why is the following. First of all, it's biconcave. That means it has concaved uh, its area and its shape on both sides. So it sort of has a pushed-in concave a look on both sides of it, sort of like this. This is a concave that's another concave, and then if you combine these two together, you have a biconcave. This is a concave, and that's a concave. That's really what we're trying to state here. Now, the reasoning for this is the following. This is going to give it a high surface area, and that's really good, as we know in biology. And in addition, the flexibility is going to be important for the following reason. We're going to have within the erythrocyte structure an elastic internal framework. So that's a very fancy way of saying something very simple. All we want to say about this elastic internal framework, this flexibility that red blood cells provide or have, is that this allows them to easily and effectively, this is really important for them to easily move through some of these very tiny microscopic capillaries, move through tiny capillaries, so caps for short, um, tiny capillaries, um, and tiny diameters of these capillaries. So these capillaries are very small, very small openings. Their diameters as blood vessels are tiny and microscopic. And therefore, if you have a flexible cell that can sort of push its way and wiggle its way through these tiny areas um, of exchange, then that means that your exchange will be successful. Your exchange will also be successful because you have a lot of surface area to do exchange on and with. So that's a very important idea with the, the erythrocyte structure. In addition, the structure of the erythrocytes, it's interesting because it lacks a couple of very critical things that you might be wondering, how can it possibly survive? Specifically, erythrocytes lack nuclei. They do not have a nucleus. And this is very, very weird. Specifically in mammals, erythrocytes present themselves without a nucleus. And this is going to only be once they are fully differentiated. So once they are completely specialized and completely in the red blood cell mode, they won't have a nucleus because a nucleus is heavy weight. What an erythrocyte wants to do, no matter what, is carry as much oxygen as possible. If you have a big nucleus in the way, that's going to disrupt and interrupt the amount of oxygen you can carry. Now you might be wondering, well, how does it know what to do if it does not have a nuclei? 
Well, that is the reason why is because of the specific protein that it has within it that it itself knows what to do based off of physics and chemistry. That's something we'll look at a little bit later. But for right now, just know that the erythrocyte is basically trying to get rid of any dead weight and make itself completely devoid of anything except for the possibility of carrying oxygen, which we'll get to. So right now, just know that there's no nucleus. In addition to this, there's also no mitochondria within erythrocytes. They lack a mitochondria. Two critical things that you might be wondering, how is it possible? Well, if they lack a mitochondria, how could they possibly move from one place to another or squeeze themselves or do any sort of cell energy work, any sort of cell process? Well, what they do is they must then use anaerobic metabolism. There's no other way they can work, do any sort of energetic uh, activity uh, unless they use some sort of anaerobic means, and that's what they do. They use anaerobic metabolism to get ATP. Because remember, the mitochondria is the electron transport chain. It's the oxidative phosphorylation part of cell respiration. It requires oxygen. Everything before the mitochondria, namely glycolysis, right, that does not require oxygen. Therefore, erythrocytes will definitely be doing lots of glycolysis, which is an anaerobic process, in order to get some, not a lot, but still some ATP. Now you might be wondering, well, don't they have this oxygen within them that they could possibly use? Well, what they do is they're the most unselfish cells in the world because they have lots of oxygen on them and within them, but they don't use O2 for themselves. Erythrocytes' number one job is to transport and deliver O2 to cells that need it, to tissues that need it, to organs that need it, not for themselves. So they have this oxygen within them. They don't use it. They don't want it. They don't need it because they don't have a mitochondria. They don't have a nucleus. All they want to do is get oxygen from point A to point B successfully. And in order to do that, they use anaerobic metabolism to drive their overall cell respiration process. Finally, I think this is a big theme to understand, is that the number one job the absolute number one job of an erythrocyte is to carry and also successfully deliver oxygen. And this is something I've been reiterating and trying to point out as we've been getting to it. This is something we're going to be focusing on now in the next flowchart, next video, when we talk about how this is done and then how this is successfully done specifically through a protein mechanism.